Hello there, welcome to Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Today we're focusing on Estonia, a country that may be small, but one that punches above its weight in many ways. The Baltic nation have just 1.3 million people, uh, has more than turned its economy around since gaining independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. Since joining the European Union and NATO at the same time in 2004, Estonians have consistently scored among the more Euro-friendly EU members and Estonia is seen as one of the most successful of the bloc's newest members on the economic front. I'm very pleased to speak today to Estonia's president, Kersti Kelyulaid, who's just passed the baton of the EU presidency to Bulgaria and who is also about to kick off a year-long party of sorts to celebrate 100 years since Estonia became an independent republic. President Kelyulaid, thank you very much for being with us. Hello. Hi there. Now, um, let's start on that celebratory note. It has been a tumultuous century for Estonia. Uh, annexation by the USSR, German invasion during World War II, back under Soviet rule until 1991, and then, as I said, entry into the EU and later in NATO, just 2004. How would you characterise your country, Estonia, on its 100th birthday? First of all, I would like to extend uh, their greatest thanks to all those people who never gave up on us uh, during the Soviet uh, occupation, because uh, it would have been so easy to uh, waver and, and move from your value-based approach uh, for your non uh, from your non-recognition policy of uh, the occupation of the Baltic states, but it never happened. Western world had uh, strategic patience, mm. which I'm afraid we again need nowadays. Uh, to look forward into the future and remain uh, the uh, value-based uh, liberal democratic community we have become. And I would describe Estonia as a natural part of the same uh, community, uh, liberal democratic uh, value-based, uh, rules-based uh, international uh, community. And this is something uh, which is extremely important for us because for small countries there is uh, absolutely no greater interest that uh, these rules-based world prevails. Well, we'll talk about Estonia's place within Europe in just a couple of minutes. First, though, there's probably a whole generation of adults now who are actually too young to remember the time when there was the Soviet Union. Uh, Estonia, as I said, emerged from that in 1991 as communist rule collapsed. I've mentioned how successful the economy is seen as being today, but how different was life back then in 1991? It is difficult to explain to people who have never had to self-censor what they are telling, even at the school. Even when you were 10 years old, your parents told you that uh, never speak about uh, independent Estonian Republic at school or it will get you into the trouble. It will get the whole family into trouble. Mm -hmm. Most of us have somebody in the family who was deported to Siberia or uh, my own grandmother, for example. She was arrested for anti-Soviet activities. She never understood what these activities exactly were and uh, she was sent to uh, Norilsk Nickel to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Gulag uh, basically for nothing as far as we can see because she definitely was not in any way actively uh, fighting uh, against the Soviet Union. The only crime was that uh, she had been married to a high-level civil servant uh, um, who actually had escaped uh, Soviet Union and uh, was at that time living outside mm -hmm. in the free world. So it was not at all easy to grow up in the Soviet Union. Economically, it was difficult, but you know, economic difficulties are not uh, comparable with the lack of freedom. Well, Estonia certainly has uh, come such a long way since 1991. As I mentioned, uh, you've just uh, ended the six-month rotating presidency of the uh, European Union. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker had some pretty high praise for yourself, for your country. Uh, let's take a listen to what he had to say just a few days ago. It was one of the best prepared and most professionally run presidencies I can remember. And once again, my long-held belief was confirmed. Smaller countries really do make for the best presidencies. They are more natural bridge builders, more likely to look for consensus. Estonia proved me right. Well, there we go, some pretty high praise there from Jean-Claude Juncker for the Estonian presidency. Uh, smaller countries in Europe,
perhaps are often overlooked as the big member states, the older, longer standing member states like France and Germany dominate in so many ways. Do you feel drowned out? Definitely not. I don't know <laughs> any international cooperation forum where small countries are better, yeah, better uh, positioned than in the European Union where basically everybody has the equal say uh, and your size does not matter. Yes, we do have on uh, some aspects um, also the voting regime, but we all know that we try to avoid uh, uh, these kind of votes as much as possible and we try to move ahead uh, consensually, which of course makes people sometimes impatient and telling that the European Union is very slow, mm -hmm. but in fact it isn't. Can you imagine doing all this work uh, on the continent without the uh, pre-agreed structure of the European Union, what we currently have? So we definitely feel uh, that the European Union serves the interest of small countries uh, quite a lot. And therefore, we put in great effort also in order to serve our community well as well. And indeed, we are very proud of the words of Jean-Claude Juncker and uh, all the people uh, who have said the same and also we are very grateful to the uh, people in the European Union institutions who helped us to achieve all these results because of course uh, no presidency happens uh, because only of the mm -hmm. uh, country who is uh, taking the lead. It's also the effort of the European Parliament, it's the effort of uh, Commission. Everybody was very much hands-on, very much in and very much helping us with our first time presidency. Well, one of the uh, gifts, perhaps, that Estonia has given to the European Union is a bit more of a focus on the digital economy, really looking forward to some uh, cutting-edge uh, innovations. Uh, the Prime Minister of Estonia spoke to the European Parliament about that issue as well. We can take a listen to him. If we want to ensure that every European is free to enjoy what Europe has to offer is the digital age. Europe must keep up with technological progress and make it work in our favour. With good reason, the Estonian presidency has called a digital presidency, promoting the digital dimension in all EU policy areas. So this digital economy that's been such a big focus for Estonia, we're always talking about how futuristic Estonia is. Uh, what is the digital economy? Why is it so important? Frankly, what is so futuristic about <laughs> doing the same in the public sector, which private sectors in all countries do anyway? The thing is quite simple. Your people and your businesses are also in the internet, mm. as are our people in Estonia. But our government realised that... Um, we need to be there together with our people and our businesses. And uh, we realized this at the turn of the century. So we have a single platform of uh, operation. And this platform uh, gives uh, us identification. And this is something which is very important, that you need to provide people with certain level of security in the cybersphere. Mm. And uh, the main problem right now is that uh, Estonian, speaking to another Estonian online, identifies each other. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're ab able to know with whom we are talking and with whom we, we are signing documents, like you do in the real life. Well, as we do live increasingly in a digital world, uh, there is a lot of debate about cyber security. Cyber attacks have been noted all around Europe, all around the world, indeed. They are a big point of concern. We've been debating this with MP MEPs, in fact. Uh, how well or how poorly prepared do you think Europe is as a continent? relatively poorly, as WannaCry, for example, uh, suggests. But you know there is hope at the end of the tunnel. Because, you know, Estonia didn't have a WannaCry problem, simply because our people have learned over the long process of becoming a digital society to uh, be hygienic in the cybersphere. So to I like watch to call passwords it, and... Absolutely. Mm. I like to call it cyber hygiene rather than <laughs> cyber defence because it's, uh, it uh, actually uh, is about civil society, about mm. people. Technology will never make cybersphere safe. It will always be about people. And we need to teach people hygiene. Similarly, as we taught people that they need to wash hands to make sure that the uh, viruses and bacteria <laughs> cannot, uh, cannot be distributed uh, among the populations. And if people say it is very hard to do, then I would argue, because when we were teaching the physical hygiene, mm. we definitely had the worst means of communication, didn't we? So it is doable. And the Sona didn't have a single WannaCry attack pass through because our people protect themselves. But I'm back to this digital identity thing. In Estonia, you don't need 
thousands of passwords and, and thousands of user accounts because you do communicate with other Estonians and Estonian companies through the same identification platform. So we have a physical token and two passwords. I think it is in general as a system much safer than the uh, diverse system of uh, having uh, tens of different usernames and passwords usually written out on your computer. Well, one of the other big worries for people in the sort of digital domain is fake news. So many people getting their news almost uniquely online, not checking which sources they're getting it from. In the last couple of days, the EU Security Commissioner Julian King spoke very explicitly about the role that he believes Moscow is playing in this uh, as a concerted effort. He called it a pro-Kremlin disinformation campaign. Top generals talking about using destabilizing propaganda as another type of armed force. Uh, this all sounds very scary. Is it a battle that the EU can win? It is a battle we can win and uh, I think uh, Julian King is uh, winning this battle by making it public, by drawing attention to the fact that this is going on. Again, there is nothing better than open discussion and open information about what is going on. And the problem is actually wider because the uh, price of information is almost zero but its value is turning uh, almost negative sometimes. We need to learn all to check our facts like previously the journalists did to us or for us. Right now we need ourselves to be our own uh, fact-checking uh, uh, well, responsibility agent. There is no other way we can, uh, we can make sure that uh, uh, we are protected. And again, this comes down to talking openly about the problem because there is absolutely no other tool. We cannot go restricting accesses. We cannot go restricting certain sites or channels of information. This would not take us nowhere. We absolutely need to just uh, tell our people, not everything you hear, not mm. everything you read is true. And this relates to everything, political information and health information online, for example. You need to know that what you are reading may not be true. In terms of potential threats from Russia, Estonia is literally on the front line. You have a, a border with Russia. Uh, there have been tensions between Estonia and Russia. There's an outstanding issue over uh, the, the border agreement that Russia's yet to ratify. Uh, we know that your government's accused Russia of violating Estonian airspace. Uh, do you believe that Russia could take things a step further? First of all, uh, as we are just talking about the new risks, cyber and hybrid risks, they are, they are geography neutral, as also uh, Julian King uh, demonstrated yesterday. So we are all in it together. Similarly, uh, indeed, we don't have yet a ratified uh, border agreement and uh, I could hereby once more call for Russian parliament to move with this ratification process. We are very ready to do so. Uh, and we regret that this is not ratified. But we do not have uh, particular tensions relating to Estonia or between Estonia and Russia. Our problems are the same problems as everybody in Europe has. The unpredictability, the uh, non-respect of its own signature under international contracts by Russia, Crimea, Georgian war. All these problems are common to us and uh, it's not so important that we also share a border with Russia. Of course, because we share a border, for us Russia would be a natural trade partner and all the sanctions affect our economy. Yet we are the strongest supporters of the sanction regime because as we started our interview, strategic patience will keep our value-based world alive. And this is what we need to achieve all together, never mind whether you are at the east or west side of the European Union. Well, indeed, Estonia perhaps occupies uh, an interesting place within the EU in that geographical sense. Uh, we've talked quite a lot recently about perhaps east-west splits growing uh, within the European Union. What kind of place within that do you see for Estonia? I don't see a particular split. It is a common split in all uh, issues on agenda. There is an eastern position and a western position. This is not how our European Union works. Uh, everybody has their own interests which might be different. Uh, but indeed it is true that the Estonians uh, are very optimistic about uh, the European Union future. The Estonians believe into the strong European Union and they are ready to contribute to the strong European Union. There are not all countries, but again, they are not uh, only in Eastern Europe, they can be also in the Western Europe. One had a referendum and uh, voted itself out of the European Union. So you see, you cannot say there is an East and West issue. Uh, countries simply differ in their opinion in different questions. 
Well, um, I'm going to just going to bring things back. Uh, we've got very little time left to that celebratory note that we started on the 100th anniversary of Estonia. What would be your vision for Estonia? Perhaps not 100 years from now, that's too far, but in 10 years' time. Our vision is our common European vision in any case. Uh, European Union uh, is also our biggest market. We can see that the uh, Nordic market is more and more converging. Estonia, Sweden, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania working closely together as an economic area. I believe this gives us uh, a little bit more economic clout. Therefore, I'm optimistic about the continuation of economic development. But above all, there is no economic development without stability and security. And we are extremely happy that uh, all our partner, partners and allies see uh, our future together in the same way. And also they come from the same uh, analysis uh, point as, as we do. Therefore, we are optimistic about uh, the future of our continent. Well, we do like to finish on an optimistic note. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for your time, President uh, Kelly Lloyd of Estonia, uh, looking to the future for Estonia and for Europe, of course. Thank you. And I would also like to add my greatest thanks to British people who are the framework nation of uh, NATO's enhanced forward presence uh, in Estonia. Similarly to French who were there with us last year, to the Danes who are there with us this year. And uh, Estonian people have also made uh, quite some effort to be a good host nation. And this is exactly how we help each other with the difficulties of this century. Okay, all those links continuing um, be beyond Brexit, I suppose. Thank you very much. Uh, looking to the future there for Estonia and Europe, President Kasti Kelyalide. And uh, that's all we've got time for on Talking Europe. We will see you very soon for more European news. In the meantime, stay tuned to France 24.